Good morning. If you wouldn't mind standing with me, please. We're in John chapter 3, starting in verse 22, the Gospel of John. John writes, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Enon near Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he, Jesus, is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him, and he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, and I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth, but he who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, but God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. But he who does not believe in the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. Let's stop there and pray. Lord, we need you to teach us. We ask you to come and give us insights and wisdoms, how to apply your word to our own life in the days ahead. So speak to us now through your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all of God's children agreed by saying, Amen. Amen. You may be seated, please. Well, we're heading into the... uh, political races already, and every time we do it uh, reminds me of a a guy who was running for governor several years ago of Massachusetts. His name was Herter, H-E-R-T-E-R, and uh, he was typical politician, shaking hands and kissing babies kind of a thing. And he was, one particular day was very busy. It was Sunday. He said he hadn't had any breakfast, left too early, didn't have any lunch, didn't have any dinner, and the last thing he was scheduled to do at the end of the day was to speak at a barbecue. (laughs) So he went to this barbecue and they were serving barbecue chicken. So he got in line like everybody else, and there's a little old lady with tongs, and she's taking pieces of chicken and putting them on each person's plate. And when he got up there, she put a single drumstick on his plate. He said, excuse me, ma'am, but I haven't had anything to eat all day could I possibly have a second piece of chicken? She says, one piece of chicken to the customer. Uh, But ma'am, you don't understand, I'm really, really hungry. She said, one. And he says, ma'am, normally he's evidently a very humble guy, but he decided to throw his weight around a little bit. He said, ma'am, do you know who I am? He said, I am the governor of Massachusetts. And she says, listen, Sonny, I'm the lady who passes out chicken. Move on, Buster. (laughs) I loved it. (laughs) Humility is what this chapter, this last part of the chapter is about. And John makes a, a pretty stunning statement. He, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease, and really that's a bumper sticker for all of our lives. Humility, spiritual maturity, is to die to self and to promote Jesus. 
in our lives. That process fights against our pride, our, our natural way of thinking. To fail to do this means having a, a childish relationship with God, to fail to understand the need for humility, and you'll never be satisfied. Uh, now, we are to be childlike in our faith, Jesus said, but not childish. That just uh, leads to difficulties. Growing maturity only comes at the expense of our own ego. <laughs> Almost every uh, young student in junior high, you probably remember when you were told the story of uh, the uh, falling apple that hit Isaac Newton on the head and it led to him starting calculations about gravity. And he was actually knighted for the work that he did and it's still the standard today for spacecraft being flown into outer space, the moon, the Mars rovers, etc. We know about Sir Isaac Newton, but we don't know very much about Edmund Haley. We know the name Haley from Haley's Comet, but there's a picture of humility here. Haley was a, a, an advocate of space flight, and this is the 1600s when uh, Newton is working on his treatise on gravity, and Haley is encouraging him to publish it. And Newton doesn't want to be published and doesn't want the, anyone to know about his work. And so Haley does all the drawings, does all the editing of the work, mathematical principles of astronomical natural philosophy is the book. And, uh, and it is still the standard of measuring trajectory for space flights. But Haley puts the whole thing together and Newton doesn't want anything to do with it, so Haley publishes it himself for Newton. And immediately Newton became famous because it's what everyone was looking for. But Haley, who had far less money than Newton, actually paid for it himself to make sure that this information about how God structured space, he was a very strong Christian, uh, was all captured by this work. Historians call it one of the most selfless acts in all of science. Now, we find it in other areas, music and sculpting and, and other dis different disciplines, but uh, it's the picture for Newton uh, to, uh, to grasp how one man could be famous by another man actually pushing him forward. I use that as an illustration because that's exactly what John the Baptist is doing with Jesus here. Not like Jesus needed an ad man or a marketing department, but that John recognized who Jesus was, and that's where this is going. I must decrease. Jesus must increase. And it's just as true in your life and mine as it was in John's. Barnabas in the New Testament... Uh, pushed Jesus, or Paul out in front, excuse me, and, and Timothy and Titus were all byproducts of this man who was looking for others to promote. It's amazing what can be accomplished if you don't care who gets the credit for it. And that's really a picture of the body of Christ down through the last 2,000 years. That's what God is calling all of us to, not self-promotion, just the opposite, Jesus' promotion. So there's three parts to this section, and it actually is a testimony, a, a witness, a teaching, if you will, from John the Baptist. The first part is the covenant is passing, 22 through 27, the Old Testament, Old Covenant. John is the last prophet in the sense of an Old Testament prophet. Now, the last book in the Old Testament is Malachi, and he was a prophet also. But John actually is overlapping the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and the New Testament of Jesus. The, the second part is this baton is being passed to Jesus of prophecy now becoming a gift for the body of Christ, not just a prophet, a man or a woman. And then this covenant takes place in 31 through 36. So first, the old covenant is leaving, verse 22. After these things, John writes, 
Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. There he remained with them and baptized. After these things is a loaded phrase with John. He uses it seven times in his gospel. There are seven miracles in his gospel that tell us who Jesus is. You'll remember Jesus did many other things in chapter 20, verse 21. Many other miracles, many other signs, but these seven John's recorded so that we might know, we, the readers, you and I, might know that Jesus is the Messiah, and knowing that, we might have eternal life. So this word, metatauta, seven times in this gospel, it's actually used in Revelation, which John also wrote, and it breaks that book up into three divisions. So they came, Jesus' disciples, out of the city of Jerusalem, out into the countryside of Judea. That's the, like a county around the city of Jerusalem. And he remained and baptized. Now, John is careful to tell us in the next chapter that Jesus himself did not personally baptize anyone. It was his disciples that are baptizing. And John and his disciples are baptizing. And uh, it is the introduction to baptism. This is a, a spot on the Jordan River, Bethabara, that we looked at uh, in chapter 1, where John was baptizing and where he baptized Jesus. And I see some in the church that are, have been to Israel with us. This is a mikvah. Uh, that's the Jewish name for a uh, like a tub that Jews washed in. But they didn't wash for repentance from sin. That is something that is happening only in this section of the Bible. They would go and wash themselves before feasts or even before meals. And the word baptism isn't actually in the Old Testament. The closest thing there is is a story, and you can go and read it this afternoon, and becomes very holy, I'm teasing, uh, in, in 2 Kings chapter 5. It is interesting, though, there was a Syrian general by the name of Nahum, and Nahum contracted leprosy, and uh, he was going to die. It was a death sentence in that day. We can control it today. We still can't cure it completely, but leprosy got him, and he was covered with these sores, and he had a, a Jewish assistant who told him that he should go down to the Jordan River and talk to a prophet named Elisha, and Elisha served a God who could heal him. And so Nahum went, and he found Elisha, and Elisha says, I want you to go into the Jordan River and wash yourself by immersion seven times. And, uh, and he looked over at the river and he said, that dirty old river, I'm not getting in that. We got cleaner rivers up in Syria, Damascus. And uh, his assistant said, it might be God. Maybe you ought to try it. What's to hurt? Just getting wet seven times. And so Nam said, yeah, you're right. Went out, dunked himself seven times. When he came up the seventh time, his skin was like baby skin, it says. is absolutely, completely healed. Now, that's the closest thing to the idea of baptism in the Old Testament. So why is it here? Why is it so important? Because God gave John that job of baptizing for the repentance, for the removal of sin. And so you repent and be baptized, John commanded, and that started... He said, I'll baptize with water, but there's one coming after me who will baptize with fire and with the Holy Spirit, speaking of Jesus. So there is this ritual washing that takes place in Judaism. Now John is doing something different. He's baptizing Jews, people who were already born into the family of Abraham, children of Abraham, and that's going to cause a confrontation. Now, verse 23, John is baptized in a place called Aeon near Salim. Now, uh, Salim means peace in uh, Arabic, and uh, we're at verse 23, and Aeon is a, a place of many springs. 
We have a shot, a picture of it. Um, we don't normally go there when we go to Israel, but this is an old map from the 5th century. And uh, the bubble on the right is the Dead Sea, and that's supposed to be a representation in a mosaic from the 5th century of this spot. Uh, this is uh, Eon. And there is a, a lot, there's a lot of springs there. It's a very marshy area. That's why they went there to baptize. Uh, there was much water, and uh, they came and were baptized. John, verse 24, has not yet been thrown into prison. We know from studying in Matthew that he would be beheaded at the request of Herod's stepdaughter, Salome. She danced and asked for John the Baptist's head, and he would be killed shortly after this. So this next section doesn't appear in Matthew. It's only in the Gospel of John. So there's a dispute. There's a debate, verse 25, between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. John's disciples are um, Jews themselves. John himself is a Jew, so this isn't a derogatory term. He's talking about the leaders of the Jew. In the Gospel of John, whenever he says Jews, he's talking about the religious leaders that came from this county, if you will, called Judea. And that's where that name comes from. So there's a dispute about purification. Purification, charismos is the Greek word. And I say that to you because it, it, it sounds like catharsis overflowing with water, and that's the root of it. But forgive me for my biochemistry background, a better translation uh, would be uh, a catheter. Now, that's a mental image I don't want you to focus on, <laughs> but I want you to know that th that is a picture of what they're arguing about, draining poisons from someone's body. And it actually is a very apt picture of what God does when he cleanses you and I from sin. In fact, the writer of this gospel will write three letters. First letter of John, he says, verse 9, if we are faithful to confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and catharsis or catharsis from all unrighteousness. What? draining poisons out of your life. That's what sin is. It's poisonous to us. It'll eventually kill us for eternity is the point. So um, I'm not sure that's anything you can use out on the street, but at least you'll understand uh, the point that's being made here. Uh, and John is suggesting that a Jewish boy was not good enough for heaven. And that was shocking to the Jews of the first century because they were children of Abraham and they assumed if you were born into a Jewish family, you must go directly to heaven. And John is saying, no, you must repent and be baptized. And they're arguing about it. Well, what he was really saying is not only do Jewish children not go to heaven unless they repent and be baptized, baptized, neither do pagan or heathen children go to heaven unless they repent and be baptized. Jesus makes us pure in a catharsis of washing of these poisons out of our lives. And uh, how do you get clean before God? You confess your sins, you surrender your life to him, and he washes you by the blood of the lamb. Verse 26, and then came to John and they said, Rabbi, teacher, he who was with you beyond the Jordan. When we were over at Bethabara, the first picture I showed you, when we were there, he came and you baptized Jesus. Remember? To whom you testified, you, you said, this is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And we listened to you, but now, He's baptizing, and all the people are coming to him. This is kind of funny, because John's disciples are upset that too many people are going to Jesus, and he's stealing all their converts. This still happens today. 
<laughs> in churches all across the world. Churches seem to want to compete for people that, uh, that need to be saved. I, I saw somebody the other day who was, uh, I hadn't seen for a while, and uh, he said, uh, oh, uh, Pastor, I haven't seen you for a while. I just wanted you to know I'm going to another church. I said, well, praise God, is it a good one? And, and he told me where it was. I said, yeah, yeah, that's a great church. In fact, we gave them the money to buy their property, and they paid us back. But yeah, we think that's a really great church. I'm glad to hear it. He said, well, I thought you might be upset with me. What? Because you're going to church and learning about Jesus? Well, it's closer to my house. Listen, I'm just glad you're going to church anywhere that teaches the Bible. Well, that's kind of what's going on here. John's disciples are saying, hey, he's stealing all our converts. So John's attitude is exactly what all of our attitudes should be. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing, a woman can receive nothing spiritual unless it has been given to him from heaven. Jesus is giving people new life, and we ought to be excited about it. And if somebody else can preach the gospel, somebody else can teach uh, the Bible well, we ought to be excited about it, that God has given that person gifts to do that, unless it had been given to him from heaven. Everything we have, spiritually speaking, everything that is good in our lives comes down, Paul wrote, from the Father of lights. Any good thing in your life and my life spiritually is a gift. We didn't earn it. We didn't merit it. It's just a gift from God. It's grace. Again, that word that means unmerited, unearned favor with God. You have favor with God. God likes you. <laughs> and I grew up in a church so away from that, 180 degrees from that, it's taken me a long time to actually believe what the Bible says is true. That God gives gifts to his children whom he loves. And he's giving you gifts right now. Romans chapter 5, verse 17 he said that this grace is coming down right here. Those who receive his abounding grace and gift of righteousness, are you listening? Those who receive, Lord, I, I want your grace right now here this morning in this service. Those who receive his grace and gift of righteousness, gift, yeah, nobody earns it, nobody merits it, nobody deserves it his gift of rightness before God. Those who receive it shall rule and reign because of the one, Christ Jesus. So God is giving gifts, and John is pointing out that gifts come from heaven and that we need to be humble about it because we didn't deserve it. This is the way Paul said to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 8.2. If anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. Now, let me give it to you more directly in the Living Bible. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. <laughs> oh, pretty clear. A person who thinks they know uh, are misinformed. So this covenant is about ready to pass. The old covenant, I'll take out your heart of stone. A new covenant is coming. Put in your heart of flesh. Put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my ways. That's the promise of the new covenant. You yourselves bear me witness. John's talking to his disciples who are complaining. You saw me. You understood. You heard what I said. Verse 28, bear witness that I said, I am not the Messiah. I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. This is just as true about you as it is about John. Just as true about me. Now, actually, this is a very freeing thing. A freeing thing to say, 
I'm not Jesus. I'm not the Messiah. I, I like to help people. I'm, it's, it's kind of built into me. But sometimes it becomes, a, I got to do something for this person. I got to fix them. And, or worse in my own life, or closer to home, my family, my children. You know, I got to fix them. I'm not God. <laughs> Surprise? No. <laughs> Anyone who knows me knows that that's a glaring truth. <laughs> it should be obvious. And to you, too. Now, this is just the beginning of the humility of John. I'm not the Christ, but I was sent before him to introduce people to him. That's your job. That's my job, too. I'm not God, but I know a little of him, and I get the privilege of telling others about him. Now, John already said that back in the first chapter, John one uh, twenty, He said he's not the Christ. And in verse 8, he said he's not the light. He's not the source of spiritual greatness for anyone, insights. He said he's not Elijah, and he's not the prophet, the prophet that Moses said was coming. He said, I'm not that either. In fact, he said, I'm not worthy to untie Jesus' sandal strap. I'm just a servant of his. So John is getting smaller and Jesus is getting bigger, which is supposed to be happening in your life and mine too. That I am supposed to be less of Ed and more of Jesus so you can see more of Jesus in me and less of me. Sometimes Ed is still very glaring. Now, John uses an illustration here that we don't get at all because we don't know what a Jewish wedding is like. Verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Now, John is saying that he's happy to be the best man. That's the closest thing we have in our traditional weddings. Now, I've done hundreds of them, maybe a thousand. And there's this moment that is close to a Jewish wedding where the father walks the bride down and uh, she's holding on to her dad's arm. And and if he's in this building, they come right here. And then the pastor says something like, who gives this woman to be married to this man? And this is the moment when fathers lock up because they're going wait a minute, I'm giving my daughter away? That little cute thing that I held in the hospital that I got all the way through school that I taught her how to drive? Give it to that guy? He's got beady eyes. I don't trust him at all. I've heard fathers out out loud say, no. (laughs) And the bride starts to cry and her mother's freaking out. Who gives this woman? No, no. (laughs) When my daughter uh, walked down on my arm, the pastor, it was Chuck Smith, said, who gives this woman to be married to this man? I said, her mother. (laughs) And that's exactly what I felt like at that moment. (laughs) Of course, then they had grandchildren, and he's the smartest man in the world. All of a sudden, instantly, it's amazing how that happened. So... What's happening in the Jewish wedding is that the father who walks the bride down is replaced by the best man. That's the best man's job, the friend of the bridegroom that John is using in verse 29. So the best man comes down with the bride holding onto his arm, and then when they get to the front, he takes the hand of the bride and he walks over to the groom and hands and puts her hand in his. The groom can't say anything up until that moment of the wedding. He has to remain absolutely silent. It's just a foretaste of the rest of his life, you understand. That's a joke, just a joke, which I'll pay for heavily. She's here. (laughs) But that's the picture that John is using that uh, when the the friend of the bridegroom hears the groom speak, 
as in this case, the picture is of Jesus speaking. And the bride is, strangely, you and I. Now, guys have a little trouble relating to this part, but you ladies will get this easier. You know, the, the groom is the guy who's going to take care of this young lady for the rest of her life and, and make sure that she grows into the right areas and protects her, et cetera, et cetera, and, and all the good things of that. And uh, that's what Jesus is doing for you. And uh, us guys maybe struggle a little bit with that point of identity, but that's the illustration. I'm happy because the groom is here. That's what John is saying. I'm happy because the groom of the bride of Christ, Jesus Christ, is here. Took a little while to make sense out of that verse, but I try and do that for you. Actually, I did it for myself first so I could understand verse 30. And then this sweeping statement, he, Jesus, must increase, but I, John the Baptist, much decrease. Must. This has been called the divine must of Scripture. It captures the essence of true Christian service, ministry, helping other people that God must increase in my life so I can be more helpful to other people by decreasing, acting like Jesus instead of acting like me. Now, there's lots of illustrations that the world even understands about that. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, JFK, the president who was shot years ago, he had a famous statement in his 1961 inaugural address. He said, And so, my fellow Americans... Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. The statement was meant to help American citizens understand their responsibility and appreciate their role in the struggle for freedom in the world, not just in our own nation. Some of that has kind of been lost lately. But uh, we still have that responsibility. We are the most blessed nation on the planet. Sorry, that's the reality of it. And, uh, and this nation, I can proudly say this morning, sends more missionaries into the world and gives more aid to other nations than any country in the world. And there's plenty of bad breaths about America right now, and, and I see the difficulties that you see and the challenges that face us as a nation in morals and ethics. But we live in a privileged, yes, I said privileged, that's not politically correct, I know. But I've also traveled all over the world, and I've been in countries where we're privileged. There's just no way to ignore that. Somebody say amen. John Riskin. Uh, speaking about humility, what JFK was pointing to. He said, uh, I believe the first test of a truly great man or woman is their humility. I do not mean by humility doubt of their own power or hesitation in speaking their opinion, but really great men and women have a feeling that the greatness is not in them, but through them that they could not do or be anything else than what God made them. That it's the Holy Spirit moving. He was saying, Christ in you is the hope of glory, to put it in scriptural terms. He was saying the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, dwells in you when you surrender your heart to him. I'm not trying to pump you up. I'm trying to point out to you the position you hold in a world of seven billion people. You have this great privilege of representing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He said, they that know God will be humble, and they that know themselves cannot be proud. In other words, <laughs> that's, that's so painful. If you really know who God is, it'll make you humble because you know you didn't deserve it, that he rescued you out of the pit out of the sewer you were living in. I don't know where you came from, but I keep reminding myself where I came from so that I'll be thankful. 
Humility is something we should constantly pray for, but yet never thank God that we have it. <laughs> it's a trap. If you say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty humble. How's that work? It's a book I've been wanting to write for a long time, Humility and How I Attained It. <laughs> it's just so wrong, you know, it just doesn't work. Years ago, uh, the missionary to, American missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, was scheduled to speak in a, in a very large Presbyterian church in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, the pastor, the moderator of the service, began this long introduction. And he went on and on about how the missionary was being used by God to change the whole nation of China, which in fact was true, but he just kept adding and adding. And finally he said, please welcome our illustrious guest. And when Taylor got up, he stood at the podium and he couldn't talk for a minute. And everybody wondered what he was choked up about. And he said, dear friends, I am the little servant of an illustrious master. I work for God. This is what he's saying. And anything you see that happened in my life that's been spiritually good is a result of something that God did, not what I did. So the covenant is passing, the baton is passed, and now the new covenant comes. Jesus is superior to John in five ways. Now this is John speaking. He's giving a sermon to his disciples still, okay? So there's five of them. It starts, number one is in verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. But he who comes from heaven is above all. Above all. Do you recognize the title of that song? We, we sing it here. The writer of it, uh, Lenny LeBlanc, has been here and sung it. Above all nations, above all kings, like a rose trampled on the ground, Jesus is above all. He who came from heaven, the one who has always been there, who has always been alive, is now and ever will be, is above all. John's saying, I'm from earth. The best I can do is tell you, I can only speak about my experience, and my experience is here on earth. Second reason why Jesus is superior, verse 32. And what he has seen and heard that he testifies that he speaks and no one receives this testimony he speaks by first-hand experience is what he's saying he spoke about things to the people john was talking about i'm i'm sure when jesus uh, was talking and he said as moses talking to nicodemus as Moses lifted up the serpent in the center of the camp, and all who looked on him were healed. And remember, we went on the story of the bronze serpent uh, that Moses was told to make because snakes were coming in and biting all the children of Israel in the Exodus. And, and he made this bronze snake, and he put it up in the center of the camp on a pole, and it's a picture of Jesus Christ on the cross in the center of Jerusalem. And so... All who look to the bronze snake, a picture of sin from the Garden of Eden, Satan was in the shape of, of a snake. Are you still with me? And, and Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus what that symbol was hundreds of years, 1,400 years earlier. That was a picture of the Messiah on the cross, Nicodemus. You have to do the same thing. When you see sin put on Jesus on the cross in the center of Jerusalem, you look to him and believe. All who looked to the snake believed and they were healed. Now, I went through that whole thing for you to realize that Jesus wasn't saying that because he'd read it in Numbers chapter 21. Jesus was there in the Exodus. That's John's point, that he had been there and he's talking about these things that he saw. When he said to Nicodemus, the, the wind blows and, and you can't see it. And, and we don't know where, from where it comes from and where it's going. He's quoting Ezekiel. But he didn't get it from the prophet Ezekiel. 
Jesus spoke through Ezekiel and told him to write it down. Again, John's point is that Jesus is first-hand experience, not teaching something he read in a book. He wrote the book, third one, verse 33. He who receives, takes in, accepts his testimony, his witness, has certified that God is true. Jesus' statements is true. Jesus, God the Son, always agrees with what God the Father and God the Holy Spirit say. And he speaks it out. You can trust anything that Jesus said. Maybe that's so obvious we don't need to go over these, but this is John's, this is the five points of John's sermon, if you will. Fourth one, 34. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. Jesus speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, by measure. Jesus has all of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist, the one who's speaking, says, I received the Holy Spirit while I was in my mother's womb. You'll remember when Mary came to visit uh, her, her cousin, that John the Baptist was in the, room, was in the womb and he leapt for joy. Jesus has had the whole power of the Spirit from before eternity through now. Last one, verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things. There it is again. All things into his hand. The Father sovereignly had granted that status to Jesus. He is the one above all. And then he gives us a summary statement. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Believes has eternal life? Sounds too simple. Sounds too easy. I want to do it the old-fashioned way. I want to earn it. (laughs) No. You believe. You look at Jesus on the cross, and you accept what he said is true, that he was dying for my sins. He was dying for yours and seven billion, billions of other people, but he was dying for my sin. I believe he took the punishment that I deserve and I have eternal life. Did I earn it? No. Did I deserve it? Definitely not. Did I do enough good things to offweigh the bad things? There's not enough time. It's grace. He who believes what Jesus said has life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see eternal life, but the wrath of God abides on him. If you do not believe that Jesus died for your sins, well, I just don't believe. You refuse. You're being stubborn, pig-headed, whatever you want to call it. Ignoramus, of which all those things fit me. And so I, I've, lived, <laughs> I've lived in that land and dwelt there for 26 years. Stupidity on two legs. So let's try and put it all together so it makes sense. F.B. Meyer, British pastor, said this about humility. I used to think that God's gifts were on shelves one above the other. And that the taller we grew as in Christian character, the easier we could reach them. But now I find that as God's gifts are on shelves one beneath the other, that it is not a question of growing taller, but of stooping lower, humbling ourselves, that we have to go down, always down, to get his best gifts. That's the journey of our lives. If we will humble ourselves, he will use us, exalt us. We live in a fallen world that even humility naturally desires to lift itself up. Just look at the ad campaigns. You deserve, (laughs) really? No, no, I deserve something different. One might argue that the highest lesson a believer has to learn is this, humility. Humility does not come by itself. We must constantly choose 
to humble ourselves. Now, that sounds very foreign to our world. I understand. And, and I see Christians struggling with, is that a right view of life? A- am I supposed to beat myself up? No, you're supposed to just admit the reality is you're a sinner. You have a black heart. Came that way. But by the grace of God, he changes us from the inside out, and we find ourselves wanting to do the right thing. But to stubbornly resist the creator of the universe who died on a cross for our sins is folly. 1986, Raylan and I just left Russia, and so we were aware of this incident. Some of you may remember it. In, in September of 1986, on the Black Sea, there was a terrible two passenger ship collision. They, they literally hit head on. They, both Russian captains filled with more than a thousand passengers. It's like the Titanic, only it was two of them. And it was just investigated. The water was unusually cold for September. There was already ice in that area. Odessa is uh, right on the Black Sea above Istanbul. And it's really a beautiful area, but this particular September, it was freezing cold. How did these two ships collide? Was the radar not working? No, no. Both ships, the captains testified the radar was working perfectly. They saw each other. Well, it was foggy. No, we had each other on radar. Well, maybe the radios didn't work. You couldn't talk to each other. No, they both said, no, the the radios worked fine. We actually talked back and forth. Well, what did you say? First captain said, turn away. Second captain said, no, you turn away. They were playing, we would say in America, chicken (laughs) with 2,000 passenger ships, ocean-going ships. And they just stared each other down and smacked each other in the, right at the tip of the bow. Good job, guys. Perfect. But hundreds of people died because of stubbornness. Now, I tell you that story because I watched men and women many times on their deathbed in the hospital and try and share Christ with them that Jesus died for them. No, I don't need God. Really? No, no, you desperately need God. Completely. There was a a French king, a French monarch, the only one who was not of royal blood, who had been a shepherd all his young life until his 30s. And then it was discovered that he was the illegitimate son, and he became the king of France. And he changed one room in the palace, and it became his own personal study, and he had a lock on it. And uh, no one saw what was in it besides the servants that brought the stuff in, but he arranged it all. And no one knew until his own son reached 21 years old. And he said, son, I want you to come into my study. I want to show you something. And so he brought his son in, and his son was surprised to find this kind of museum display. There was this old shepherd's tent, and his father explained, that's the tent I used to sleep in when I was taking care of sheep. And and there was a shepherd's crook leaning against the wall, and, and that's what I used to pull the sheep out of dangerous places. And then his clothing were there, his shepherd's clothes, and they were all tattered because they were more than 30 years old now, or 21 years old. And his son said, Dad, why are you keeping all these things in this vault like? And he said, quote, if ever my heart is tempted to pride, I go into that room and I remind myself of all of what I once was and from where I really came. Would you stand, please, and we'll pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you know where each of us have come from. And we're so thankful that you are the God who has given grace, unmerited favor, forgiveness of sin to all who 
throw themselves on you. We are so grateful for your grace and love to us. And, and Lord, we pray for anyone within the sound of my voice who hears this, or maybe here in this room here this morning, that have not surrendered their lives to you. And we pray that you would give them the grace to do so now. Christians, please pray. So I wonder if there's someone here in the service, maybe you're visiting for the first time, maybe you've been here before, but God has been speaking to you, and now you see it. You, you need to surrender to God. You need to ask him to forgive your life. If you're in that condition, and you would like to be forgiven, would you let me know that you're ready by looking up at me and raising your hand? I won't embarrass you. I just want to make sure there's someone here and not waste our time if there's not. Anyone here this morning God is speaking to about surrender? Yes, in the back row. God bless you. And here, yes, two of you. God bless you. Anyone over here God is speaking to? Yes, young man with your hand up. God bless you. If I missed your hand, don't worry, God didn't. But those of you that raised your hands, would you please pray out loud to God? We're going to make it easy for you. We'll do it along with you. So we'll all say it together. Please, everybody, please say, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive my sins. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The, the three or four of you that raised your hands and those that didn't, that should have, we encourage you to go over these double doors to my right. Some of our elders are there. We'd love to give you a Bible, pray for you. If you're sick or you need someone to pray for you, please go there too. To the rest, God bless you. Have a wonderful day.